Hi everyone. Um, we're going to look at the. Um, I'm going to re-record the presentation on comparing means. The link to the server does not seem to be linking you to the correct um, presentation. So um, we'll just redo it here, and I am going to share my um, my screen with you so that you have the presentation. So um, when we're talking about comparing means, it's important for us to remember that comparing means is really based on the relationship between two samples. So you could have a pretest, post test sample, or you could have a treatment and control group sample, but you really want to um, think about comparing the means of two different groups. And both of those groups are going to have means and variance. And the effect size is the difference between the group means or the degree of separation between the groups. Now, when we're talking about comparing means, we have to kind of review and keep in mind that this is all based on the general linear model. And when we think about sort of the logic behind the general lineal, linear model, we know that there's an observed value on the dependent variable. And then um, that observed value is um, the result of uh, the sum of effects of allowed for factors plus the sum of effects of other factors. And um, that's, that's uh, your explanatory variables and then your um, compounding variables. We have to keep in mind um, the whole idea of error variance. And unexplained variance due to all the unknown factors or even some of the predictable factors that we know could be confounders influencing the group member's response. Um, and then the error is all sources of variability not explained by the independent variable. So we really want to keep in mind within group variability um, and as we um, remember how we reject the null hypothesis and do not reject the null hypothesis, we remember that the subjects within a group do not respond in the same way. And there's little or, or no overlap in response um, versus overlapping scores. Many subjects from both groups have the same score. So if they're two independent groups, with no overlap, it's real clear that we want to reject the null hypothesis. But if we have overlap and there's um, overlapping scores with many subjects from both groups having the same score, then we don't want to reject the null hypothesis. Now the actual calculation um, of the statistic when you are comparing means you do statistical analysis for determining the treatment effect. Are there differences true to the population differences or are the differences by chance alone? And the significance of the differences between group means is derived by the ratio of differences between group means over the variability within the group. So your null hypothesis, or hypothesis zero, which refers to the null hypothesis, is that the mean of group one is going to be equal to the mean of group two. And that, if we were talking about a pretest, post test design, and the pretest was equal to the post test, that would mean that our null hypothesis um, was accepted, that our treatment didn't make any difference. 
your alternative hypothesis, and that's usually um, abbreviated as the capital H1, is that the mean of group one is not e going to be equal to the mean of group two, and then you use a two-tailed test. That means we can't predict that it'll go one way or the other, but we don't think they're going to be the same. And then the directional hypothesis is when we have enough preliminary data from our pilot test or from our previous work that suggests that the mean of group one is going to be greater than the mean of group two, or the mean of group one is going to be less than the mean of group two. And then you can use a one-tail test. But remember, uh, Dr. Cook, when he spoke to you at the intensives, really cautioned us against um, using directional hypothesis unless we have really strong data to support this. You also have to keep in mind when we're comparing means that we have some assumptions and you want to use parametric statistics if, um, if we meet the assumptions. And the parametric statistics require equal variance among groups or homogeneity of variance. So the variance is expected to be equivalent among the groups and larger samples are more likely to have that equal variance. If you have a real small sample size, you um, can violate that assumption and then parametric tests should not be used. The statistical tests include a comparison of variance between the groups. So when we talk about um, comparing means, a few tests that we might use are listed for you in the bubbles here. The independent t-tests, paired t-test, and ANOVA are three common ones that are used. In selecting the appropriate statistic, um, or the statistical analysis approach for comparing means um, in two or more groups will be covered now. So let's talk first about independent t-tests. Independent or unpaired t-tests are used to compare means of two independent samples. So if we want to look at the difference between a treatment and a control group, and let's say um, we're going to give Tylenol and ibuprofen to a child with a fever. And after we administer Tylenol and ibuprofen uh, to two separate groups of um, children with fever, we can then see how those two groups respond and see if they seem to respond better to Tylenol or better to ibuprofen. That would... Um, be an appropriate study for the independent or unpaired t-test to compare the means of those two groups. Two independent groups are compared. Um, they may be randomized. They can be a convenient sample. They're intact groups and there's no repeated measures. And once again, there's the statistic for you. I don't personally think it's worth memorizing any of these because you're going to use your statistical software packages to calculate them for you. I don't know anybody who does it by hand anymore. But conceptually remember that the t-test is equal to this um, ratio of the effect size, the difference between the means, um, over the standard error of the difference between the means. So um, first, you need the pooled variance estimate. When the assumption of equality of variance is not met, we use, we use a pooled variance estimate. And it's an estimate of the population variance. And um, you can see, again, the formula for you there um, with the degrees of freedom being n minus 2 for the combined sample size. Um, once again, let's just talk about the one versus two-tailed test. Now, we've already said, unless you have preliminary work that strongly supports um, that you have enough data to, um, to predict that the um, hypothesis is going to go in one direction versus another, you're going to use the two-tailed test. But if you have a lot of data and you're really certain from your previous work 
that you can predict the direction, then you can use the one tail test. The T statistic for unequal variance. Um, the validity of unpaired t-test is not compromised by unequal variance unless there are unequal sample sizes. So there, if the test for equality of variance shows significant differences, the t-ratio must be adjusted. So here's what your computer printout is going to look like if you're using the independent samples t-test. And you can see that circled in red there for you is um, the two-tailed test. We didn't have enough data here to suggest that we um, could have a directional hypothesis. So our um, alternative hypothesis for this particular uh, um, test is going to be that the means of the two groups are not equal. So your Levine's test um, compares the variance of the two groups. And um, you can see that as number one. Then number two is the two-tailed test due to the non-directional hypothesis. And then the next column is three. The differences between the means is the numerator. And four is the standard error of the difference between the means and that becomes your denominator. Five is the 95th um, confidence interval um, that does not contain zero, so it's significant. And then six, if unequal variance use the lower row of numbers. Um, and so for this particular um, printout, our significance is uh, 0.024 which means um, a significant difference between the two groups. So now let's talk about paired t-test and think of um, when would you use a paired t-test versus an independent t-test. So paired t-test is um, like your pretest, post-test. And um, so it's the same subject and we're um, obtaining two samples from the same subject. So it could be, it could be our, um, um, our same example with treating a fever with Tylenol, but we want to look at um, how effective it is in decreasing and how quickly. Um, so we would do um, temperature before we gave the Tylenol and after we gave the Tylenol, and there would be a pre and post test measure on it each and every child. So the repeated measure or the match design um, will improve the degree of control over the extraneous variables because we can't say it's um, the child's uh, clothing or the child's um, how they're um, hydrated or something like that that may be the difference in these two groups it's really um, measuring the same thing in the same child. So if we talk about the t-test for paired samples, um, you can use it for repeated measures or match designs. And the data are paired or correlated, um, so you use the paired t-test analyzes the difference in scores within each pair, and the subjects are compared with themselves or a match, and it reduces error variance because extraneous factors are equal. Um, and here again would be um, the mean of differences of the scores um, over the standard error of the differences in scores. And there again is your t-test um, statistic for the paired data. Your paired data t-test um, uh, printout looks something like this, and you can see um, pre-cheese and post-cheese, and, um, and you can uh, see that they did a two-tailed um, paired sample t-test here. 
only um, used to compare two means. Increase in the number of comparisons increases the risk of type 1 error. So if alpha is at 0 0.05, there is a 5% 5% chance of type 1 error for each comparison. So you can't use multiple t-tests. So if we have multiple comparisons to make, we want to use ANOVA. And um, so if we accept the null hypothesis, um, it means all the means are the same. And we really, um, ANOVA stands for Analysis of Variance. So let's just talk a little bit more about this. So if you have a multi-level design, or you have a multi-factorial design, or you have three or more groups or conditions, you want to consider Analysis of Variance. So um, one uh, one type of ANOVA that we want to consider is one-way ANOVA. And that looks at the total variability in each score, and it helps you look at the between treatment variance in each cell and the within treatment variance or the error term. So analysis of variance for an independent sample um, really looks at a single factor experiment with three or more independent groups um, being compared. So there's only one independent variable, but you have three groups. So you're saying the mean of group one is equal to the mean of group two is equal to the mean of group three, and that is your null hypothesis. The test statistic um, uh, for ANOVA is the F test, and um, we really talk about the sums of squares. So the F test determines how much of the observed variability in the score can be explained by the difference among the means and how much is due to differences among subjects. So the larger the sum of squares, the greater the variability of scores within a sample. So the variability in the data, there can be two different sources of that variability. It can be the treatment effect, which is the between group differences, and then there can be the unexplained variance, which is the error variance within groups. So as an example of this, we could talk about um, looking at um, some of the work that I've done around support groups for kids with addicted parents. What we found, we did pre and post uh, test, and then we did a follow-up assessments. And um, the treatment effect would be looking at the differences between the treatment and control group. But the unexplained variance could be the age of the child, um, and it could be the gender of the child. All of those sorts of things might be the, the um, unexplained variants. So here is a printout from a, a test of between subject effects. So the dependent uh, variable on this particular study was the duration of breastfeeding in weeks. And um, you can see that we had the, um, the uh, sum of squares listed for you there in the second column, the errors listed, and the total is listed, and then we have your F statistic, um, and you can see that it was um, significant at the 0 .000 level. Now, when we talk about the F ratio, we're talking about the mean square values that are used to calculate um, the F ratio. And again, you can see there are the, um, the formulas there for you, but really you're probably going to just rely on SPSS to calculate them for you. And it, 
after you get those um, scores, you compare them to critical values. And they're actually in the appendix in your textbook, but again, your printout is going to make all, your, your SPSS printout is going to make all of that um, information available to you um, in one place. So a significant F ratio indicates a significant difference between at least two of the means. And then you have to do follow-up with multiple comparison tests to know the direction of those differences and um, what those differences are between the different groups. So let's move on and talk about ANOVA, the two-way classification approach. So a two-way or a factorial ANOVA is the total variability of each score looking at between treatment variants and within treatment variants. And the between treatment uh, variants is, um, is really defined by the main effect of factor A, the main effect of factor B, and the interaction effect of factors A and B. A good example of this is the um, childhood obesity study that we just um, completed. So if we talk about um, using uh, the two-way factorial ANOVA design, and we looked at um, the, the treatment, what we did was um, web-based training with and without our technology support. And we did three time points. We did before the training, after the training, and, um, and six months after. And we also looked at um, the differences between the groups, those that got the technology and those who did not. So the main effect of our um, training was factor A, and that was looking at the, the time effect or the main effect of the training. So if there were differences on the main effect or the time effect from pre to post, that means that the training was effective in changing the practice of the providers. The main effect of factor B was um, the technology. Were there differences between the technology group um, and, and the control group or the non-technology group? And, um, and what we found is there were significant differences at baseline in all three time points, which just means our groups were not um, different um, to, to our, our, our um, two groups were different at baseline. The interaction effect helps you look at whether or not there was an interaction between the pretest and the post test um, or the time effect, the training and whether or not the technology um, made any difference. And so if you have an interaction effect, then you have to look at um, which direction that was in. And what we found in our results is that everybody got better. The main effect, the time effect, the training improved everybody's practice. But in many of the variables, there also was an interaction effect where those that got the technology got significantly better than those who um, just received the training. So one example um, of, of this type of design is, um, is outlined for you here. So you have patients that can be both male and female, and then you're going to give them the three different drugs, one, two, and three. And there's your data. So again, two-way analysis of variants in indicates a two-dimensional analysis involving two independent variables. And in this particular case, it was gender and drug. The two-way ANOVA then looks at between group variants um, that explains the independent variable effect. So the effect of variable A, um, independent of B, the effect of variable B, independent of A, and then the joint effect or the interaction of A and B. And then um, that uh, is, is calculated along with the error variance, which accounts for all the other sources of variance. 
Okay, so one, one more example that I want to provide here real quickly is the three-way ANOVA, and that's the three-way classification. Um, if we talk about three-way ANOVA, you have a main effect of A, main effect of B, main effect of C, and your interaction. So it's exactly the same idea, only um, there are three variables. The three-way ANOVA, um, again, does the sum of squares, um, but it's calculated for each of the effects. The F ratio is calculated for the main effect and each of the interaction effects. And it allow, allows examination of, of the influence of several combinations of variables. So here's an outline of um, how you would look at all the different possible combinations if you were looking at these three separate variables. So you have three main effects, one for each independent variable, three double interactions for each pair, and a triple interaction. So here's an example of um, a three-way ANOVA with um, this is satisfaction with pay, and they looked at age, gender, rank, and then they looked at age and gender, rank and gender, rank and age, and then they looked at all things combined. And you can see for age by itself, it was not significant. For gender by itself, it was. For rank, it was. For gender by age, it was. Rank by gender, it was. Rank and age, it was. And rank by gender and age, it was not. So um, the next thing I want to bring in here is the repeated measures analysis of variance. And that's the same idea of the ANOVA, only you have repeated measures. That's not just a pre-post or two measures. So if, if we used a re, a repeated measures design, if the interest in each subject um, responds over several experimental conditions is what you're after, and then the within subjects design, comparing the means of the treatment condition versus groups, and control for the individual differences, the lower error variance, and it's more powerful. So here's an example of a single factor repeated um, measures design. All treatments are administered to all subjects, and then you follow it over time. And you can see um, how they, they um, plotted the, the response to these subjects here. And here again is um, the initial score for females, um, you can see is the blue triangle. The initial score for males is the red square. The final score for females is the black triangle. And um, the final score for males is the red X. So repeated measures ANOVA helps us look at the meaning of that data, and it evaluates each subject under several experimental conditions. So the practice or carryover effects are, are minimal, um, and the performance across treatment levels are of interest. Within subject design and individual differences are controlled. The error variance is smaller uh, than in randomized design. So the assumptions with repeated measures design, um, it, first it needs to meet the assumption of sphericity, which um, means that the differences in scores across treatments will be relatively equal, and the violations of assumptions do not seriously affect the validity of the analysis unless the sample sizes are unequal. So again, you need equal samples, and repeated measures test is too liberal, when variances are not corrected. And remember um, how we talked about increasing the risk of type one error when you do multiple um, comparisons. So the multivariate tests um, do not require uh, sphericity and um, they are listed here for you and um, they're converted to an F ratio.
There's two approaches to repeated measures ANOVA. There's the univariate test, which is the standard F test, and um, it's adjusted for a violation of sphericity. Um, the Malky's test of sphericity is done to determine the if the adjustment is needed. If the sphericity is significant, decrease the degrees of freedom, making the critical value um, of left or F larger. So the degrees of freedom for the F ratio are adjusted by multiplying them by a correction factor using either the greenhouse geyser cor correction or the Hunfelt correction. And both of those are little boxes that you can check on the SPSS. So you're going to check for um, the violation of sphericity and then make the correction if needed. There's step-by-step -step instructions for all of this. Um, as we talked about um, on this link and also are on the CRNS um, website. And those links are in the course Canvas shell. There's going to be um, more details on multivariate analysis, multivariate analysis um, to come in your Quant 2 course. So um, that is the um, lecture on the comparing means. And now I would like you to um, take a look at some of the practice opportunities in the Canvas shell before you go to complete the assignment um, on uh, completing the analysis. And I look forward to talking with you um, during our Zoom conferences.